Prime Minister, thank you so much for doing this with us today. Well, thanks for having me. I want to start by looking forward to yeah. 2013 and all the issues on your agenda as Prime Minister of this country. What keeps you up at night? What worries you the most about the coming year? Well, look, lots of, <laughs> lots of things worry me, but what the focus of our energies will continue to be the economy. You know, we continue to be, we're, we're four years into this uh, crisis, we continue to be in, a, in an economic world that has considerable uncertainty. At the same time, as you know, Canada's uh, been doing relatively well, and I guess what we've increasingly uh, just tried to do is let's, you know, look past the periodic crises that seem to keep coming and let's uh, try and focus on what we can do to keep uh, creating high quality jobs in this country, uh, laying the foundations for prosperity in the long term. And that's what we've been focused on, you know, uh, making sure our fiscal situation remains strong, our, our, our debt levels remain low, our deficit keeps falling, our taxes stay low, investing in training, investing in technology, trying to transform uh, government and trying to diversify our trade markets. Those are really, the, we call the five T's, those are mm. the things we're going to continue to focus on in the coming year. It almost feels to some extent, though, that events are out of our control because of what's happening in Europe, because of what's happening in the United States. The U.S. at this crossroads now, and if U.S. lawmakers can't come to some compromise over tax hikes and spending cuts, they, they could drag all of us over the so-called cliff. Uh, I guess on a, on a scale of 1 to 10 right now, how confident are you about all that? Uh, you know, I feel, I feel not bad about the fiscal cliff issue. Um, I do think lawmakers there will arrive at at least some partial compromises to avert catastrophe on January 1st or in the month of January. Um, I think their bigger challenge is going to be after January. The, the U.S. fiscal situation, if you look at it, is a runaway train. And, you know, they're running deficits of a trillion dollars plus, and that cannot continue. And so over the medium term, they're going to have to have a plan to deal with that. It's not going to hit any of us. Uh, immediately, but those are issues they're going to have to deal with. As in Europe, you know, obviously big, big issues there with the, with the eurozone, with all of the uh, the debt problems, the sovereign debt problems, the banking crises that are all interwoven. Uh, you know, as I say, I think we will, we obviously will continue to feel the headwinds of these things because we're part of a global economy, and these are some of, especially the United States, these are some of our biggest markets. But the U.S. is showing some signs of growth. And as I say, I think if we just can keep focused on what we can do in Canada over the longer term to keep our economy growing and performing better, and of course diversifying our markets, that's what we need to do and that's what we'll continue to focus Which on. Which is looking elsewhere beyond the United States and Europe. Yeah, looking, uh, you know, we've, uh, under uh, this government, we've tried to diversify. In fact, I think for the first time in history, we are really diversifying our markets. We've signed uh, trade agreements with nine new countries. We only had five when we came into office. And we're now negotiating with some big players, not just uh, the European Union, but India and Japan and uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, um, you know, we're going to have to continue to do this. Obviously, a lot of the growth in the longer term is going to be outside of our traditional markets. And we want to make sure Canada is part of that. And uh, we're having some success, but we've got a long way to go. I wanted to stay on the topic of uh, the economy. Uh, you know, I think I've lost track of the number of stories that we have done on Global National warning Canadians about household debt. Right. I know your finance minister has issued repeated warnings. The governor of the Bank of Canada has issued repeated warnings. It is at its highest level ever, record levels of household debt in this country. What is it about our culture, do you think, that people continue to think they can live beyond their means? Well, you know, I, I, I'd be cautious on how we phrase that. Um, I, I think what's happening is people think they are, in fact, living within their means. If you look at the growth of debt in, in the country, uh, it has been obviously primarily mortgage debt. And what has happened is with, you know, historically low interest rates, very low interest rates, and with most Canadians feeling, you know, certainly compared to other Western nations, feeling pretty good about the economy, uh, people have been confident about going out and borrowing these uh, sums of money. Obviously, I share the concerns of the Minister of Finance, the Governor of the Bank of Canada, and others that we are approaching a limit here, and that's why the government has taken some measures to provide incentives to households not to borrow uh, quite so much. But, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is this is decisions that households have to make for themselves. I'm convinced we're, we're now seeing a, moder uh, a moderating trend in this, and I think it'll start to turn down in the next year, and two, a year or two. But we continue to urge people to have caution because eventually, 
uh, interest rates will go up. They and you should be up. asking yourself, if interest rates were a couple of points higher, can I really afford the debt load I'm taking on now? And so we just urge people to be cautious mm -hmm. on that. There could be some rude shocks in the year or two ahead when interest rates do rise, right? Um, for some, for some. You know, many households, are, many households are well within a comfort level, but some have been pushing the envelope, mm -hmm. and we obviously urge them to be cautious. If there is one thing you would tell Canadians to prepare for economically in the next year, what might that be? Well, you know, that would probably be on a personal level, that would be the biggest thing. Watch your debt levels. Debt levels are getting high in the country. Be cautious. We, you know, I know the country's doing well, but we are in a period of considerable global uncertainty. Interest rate shocks are possible. Uh, so watch that. Uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, we just also tell Canadians what we're trying to do ourselves, which is try not get to get too focused on the day-to-day -day headlines and on the day-to-day -day crises coming out of the United States and Europe. Let's focus as a country and focus as an investor or a worker on what you can do uh, to make uh, your job and your company uh, more competitive in the years to come, and that's what we're focused on. Okay. I want to talk about what many people call this ticking time bomb, the demographic shift that's yeah. happening in our country, the bulge of baby boomers who are either retiring now or on the verge of retirement. Couple that with the fact that I think 60% of Canadians don't have access to a private pension plan, and the fact that we're all living longer than we mm -hmm. ever have before. How are middle-class Canadians going to cope in the, not just in the next year, but in the next decade? Well, you know, obviously we've taken some, some steps as a government to try and deal with that. We are, uh, we're certainly aware that, you know, as a federal government, there are two effects of this uh, aging demographic that we, we have to worry about. One has obviously been the effect on our uh, old age security payments, our pension plans. The good news, of course, we've taken, they're not necessarily the most popular steps in the world, but we've taken some things to make sure those plans are affordable. And the Canada Pension Plan, you know, unlike Social Security in the United States or some other pension plans around the world, is actuarially sound for 75 years to come. So we've, we've got a pretty good situation at the government level. The other thing we're worried about is the effect this is, this is having and is going to continue to have on the labor market. We already, even with the challenging economic situation, we have serious labor shortages in many mm -hmm regions of our economy and in many sectors of our economy. And that will be one of the big challenges as we look at the budget and look at our next uh, economic action plan measures going forward. How do we make sure Canadians get trained and get qualified for the jobs we know are going to exist? And we, are go we, we should not have an, an unemployment problem in the, in the decades to come. We're going to have a labor shortage problem. We need to take advantage of that and make sure uh, Canadians fit those, uh, fit those positions. For individual Canadians, look, we just, we just once again, we tell people to look carefully at their debt levels, but also do save. Think, think of the longer term. The government has provided um, a range of savings vehicles to Canadians, you know, not just the compulsory Canada Pension Plan, but there's the voluntary uh, registered retirement uh, plans that also exist, both employer and also personal. You can do that personally. You get tax write-offs for that. We created the tax-free savings accounts so that Canadians can put some after-tax income as well and shelter that from, uh, from future taxation. So there are lots of vehicles there, and there are lots of people who are saving. Um, what I'd say to all Canadians is balance your debt levels, balance your borrowing, balance your, your, uh, your ambitions in terms of house ownership with some savings as well. Um, lots of Canadians are, are in very good financial situation and, and given the prosperity we do have, uh, Canadians take advantage of these tax incentives. They will save themselves money and put themselves in a very good position. So that's what we're encouraging. I want to talk a little bit more about the shortage of skilled labor in this country. I know yeah. you're making changes to allow more foreign workers to come in to take those jobs in the, in the immediate future so that companies have the skilled workers. Well, there's, uh, John, if I could just say there are two things we're doing there. I think it's important to, uh, to make the distinction. One thing we're trying to do is to orient our general immigration system more towards the labor force needs. Um, we have been making some fairly profound changes to how we handle uh, immigration. We have traditionally just been a, a country that passively accepts applications. We are now trying to go out and shape uh, those immigration applications and process those in a way that will serve the labor force holes that are emerging and obviously provide immigrants themselves with the opportunity to really uh, succeed and succeed quickly in our economy. The issue you raise is the issue of, of temporary foreign workers. Um, you know, I, I tend to see temporary foreign workers as really a fallback 
uh, situation where you know there's an immediate need as, mm -hmm. as we you know often have in Alberta particularly in some low uh, wage occupations there just are simply not uh, there's simply not the Canadian labor force available so we we bring in people and give them short-term opportunity but you know I see that as a quite frankly a, a kind of a band-aid solution what we really need are Canadians trained for the jobs and we need an immigration system that's going to bring, bring people in permanently to take advantage of those opportunities. What changes need to take place to get Canadians skilled in the jobs that are the jobs of the future. Uh, one of the yeah. things I wonder is if there's been traditionally a real emphasis on university education for a lot of people mm -hmm. and that has been fantastic and more people are getting university degrees than they have in past generations but I think on the flip side of that you have a lot of kids as some of the people in my parents generation would say who have these fancy university degrees and can't find a job. Well look we know I've said this to many business groups and academic groups. We, I think by now we know that, you know, left to its own devices, our, our education system seems to be producing a shortage of tradespeople, a shortage of scientists, a shortage of engineers. Those, some of those are the big areas where we're going to have holes in the years to come. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think, Donna, this is anything that one government can deal with. Obviously, we're, you know, we're putting some incentives in to encourage trade, trades education. Uh, we're doing some things on the immigration system to try and identify the people we need to fill the, the holes in the labor market. But we do also need educational institutions. We need provinces who have the primary responsibility for education to start trying to reorient their programs in that direction. I've talked to several premiers, and I know they are, but I think that's a big challenge that you know we all have both levels of government and we should think about how can we work together in the future to produce more people for the jobs we know we're going to exist and maybe in some cases uh, a few a fewer people for some of the jobs we know won't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk fighter jets for a moment. I don't sure. want to go through all of the numbers yeah. because I think we've done that uh, and what I'm wondering is why wasn't there more transparency about the full cost of the fighter jet program right from the beginning and do you wish in retrospect that there had been? Well I think we've been very clear about uh, what the numbers are that uh, we've projected which which actually have been validated by the recent KPMG report but what the Auditor General said in the spring was he looked at um, the process uh, as it had gone to this point and, and you know let's remember we're very early in the process we haven't spent any money on acquiring uh, the next generation of, of fighter jets but he said that uh, he thought that uh, both the costs uh, and the options analysis had not been as thorough as it should be so based on that the government has you know reset those parts of the process and we're going through that again as I say I think the cost numbers uh, from the KPMG report look in fact identical to what the government has uh, budgeted uh, but they'll also do an options analysis I think what happened here I think it's very easy to explain the process whether it's right or wrong is you know back in 1997 the previous government made a decision uh, with an international with with its allies to be involved in an international consortium to actually develop the new fighter jet and to make sure that Canadian industry was part and parcel of the development of that airplane as opposed to coming in after the fact and trying to get what we call industrial and regional benefits. And so um, there would be Canadian jobs. There would be Canadian jobs, a much more profound position of Canada in the worldwide supply chain for this aircraft. I think because of that, an assumption was just made all along the way that, of course, if we're developing this plane, this will be the plane we're, we're purchasing. That's an, not an unreasonable assumption. But I think what the Auditor General had pointed out is because of that, um, National Defense had not done as thorough as an analysis as it should on some aspects of this, both costs and options, and that's what we're, we're now doing. And uh, we will continue to do that, and we've been very clear. We've set up a multi-stage process. We set up some independent expert panels and we'll uh, we'll you know we'll go through this step by step to make sure we are making the right purchases the CF-18 the current fighter jet fleet will start to reach the end of its life in the middle to end of this decade and uh, we'll make sure both that uh, we have aircraft ready to go when we need that and also at the same time that Canada is involved in the development of, uh, of next generation airplanes Let's talk about the Chinese. Uh, your government approved a Chinese state-owned company to yeah. take over Nexon, one of Canada's largest natural resource companies. But then, as soon as you said yes, you said, but there's no trend here, That's just right. to be clear to Canadians. Yeah. And you said, we're not going to do this again, except in its exceptional circumstances. It sounded like 
yes, but with reservations. Was China just too big to say no to? No. Look, I think what's what's happened here, as I as I said to Canadians, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a big change in the global marketplace. You know, the previous Conservative government, many decades ago, opened up foreign investment in Canada because, uh, you know, as Conservatives, we decided we could see the economy becoming a global market economy, and we wanted Canada a position to both accept uh, investment and to be an outward supplier of investment in the global marketplace. What has happened in the past generation, and we've seen an accelerating trend now in this country, is that in the name of global market economy, foreign governments are actually coming in and becoming the, uh, the purchasers of assets. And look, individually, uh, look, individual transactions like Nexon, uh, not necessarily a concern in that regard, uh, we can have foreign government investment as part of our mix. But we do not want our economy transformed from a private sector market economy into a state-run economy. We don't want the Canadian government running Right, we uh, got out of all of we that. We don't want the Canadian yes. government running our economy, so why would we want foreign governments running our economy? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we t obviously uh, what's been happening the past few near years is the size and scope and amount of government control in these transactions has been increasing very rapidly. So we looked at the Nexon uh, decision and decided that this does not transform our economy, and, and obviously we've got a number of undertakings from, uh, from the CNOC company that we're comfortable with. But this is not a trend that we can have continue. So we've been very clear that this will be the limit of government, foreign government control in the oil sands sector. And we're going to continue to monitor this in other parts of the economy to make sure that we don't risk the transformation of our economy elsewhere. We want to have foreign investment and, as I say, some foreign government uh, money will be part of the mix, but we're not going to transform our economy from a market economy into an economy controlled by foreign governments. That's not acceptable to the government of Canada. I don't think it's acceptable to Canadians and we won't go there. You know, the Americans have raised red flags about state-owned yeah. Chinese companies and espionage. I think your government had some concerns about that in the years past, too. Uh, are there any risks with this deal? Um, all, Canadians should know that all foreign, all, all foreign investment transactions, you know, in, in terms of monitoring a transaction, what we call net benefit on the industrial side, that's done according to thresholds, a certain amount, $330 million for state-owned enterprises. But when it comes to any foreign transaction of any size, they are all monitored and evaluated on the national security risk basis. And certainly uh, assessments were done on the CNOC transaction and they did not raise flags that would cause us to uh, prevent the transaction. We do have, if I can say, Donna, we do have a different system in the United States. Uh, we try to be more transparent. The truth of the matter is that the United States uses national security extremely broadly. In my judgment, they would probably dispute this. In my judgment, I think it at times becomes a front for protectionism. We try and restrict our national security analysis to genuine threats to national security, and we try and evaluate the economic effects according to what we call the net benefit test. And I think that's a, a wiser and fairer way to handle foreign investment. Okay. I want to talk a bit about Syria. Do you agree with NATO's Secretary General that the Syrian regime is on the brink of collapse? Um, I, I, I might not put it quite so dramatically, but look, I think the, um, I think, I, I would say this, I think the days of that regime are, are certainly numbered. I don't believe the regime, uh, the Assad regime can survive. Um, what I think we should all turn our minds to is what do we want to see come next? Now, we may not have a lot of control over this. But to be frank, uh, I can tell you that our government, myself and my cabinet colleagues, we are concerned by the nature of the Syrian conflict. Um, it is, at its heart, in our judgment, still a sectarian conflict with a Shia Alawite dominated government on the one hand and a Sunni dominated opposition on the other. Um, you know, what we would like to see done, what we think the international community should be focused on is how can we assure that when a transition comes, it leads to a broadly based government that respects religious freedom, protects minorities, instead of just descending into a sectarian warfare and chaos. This is our major concern. I think it should be a concern of all actors, and, uh, and that's what we're going to increasingly have to put our minds to, as I think the Assad regime becomes more and more fragile. Do you think there is any possibility that NATO would 
at any point intervene in Syria in particular if chemical weapons become a factor? Well, I don't want to speculate. As you, you've noticed that President Obama and, and other of our allies have said uh, that the use of chemical weapons, the use of chemical biological weapons, some of these things would obviously cause grave concerns to the international community. They would certainly cause grave concerns to our own country. Is it a red line for you as um, it is for the president? Well, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of what they've indicated. Um, and obviously, we always ask our militaries to be constantly examining what uh, can and cannot be done. But I would, I would think that any, you know, to be blunt about it, that any military intervention in this part of the world, um, any talk of that should be undertaken with great caution. Um, there are enormous dangers here, enormous risks. And I think what we can continue to do, as I say, is try and work with elements of the opposition and others to try and push that country to a better solution and try and avoid further escalation of this conflict. I want to ask you about the school shooting in uh, yeah. Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, such an unbelievable tragedy. I could hardly maintain my composure on the day of I'm that sure. shooting on air as we saw President Obama you know, wiping away tears that day as well. I think anyone who is a parent, and I have a young son, uh, just couldn't imagine having to deal with what those parents were dealing with. As a father, how did it affect you? Well, I, uh, you know, I'm sure it affected me the way it affected everybody. Um, you know, really, Don, I got to the stage where I really couldn't watch it any longer. Um, uh, you know, I think once you've, once you've been a father, um, you're affected by the deaths of children, you know, in a much more profound way than, than other people. And uh, I, I just, you know, I, it, it's hard for me it's hard for me to talk about it. It's hard for me to imagine how anybody can be so uh, deranged, so angry, so troubled that they would do such a thing. It, it's, it's, it's really beyond our comprehension. A lot of Canadians, a lot of Americans, of course, and Canadians too, struggled to talk to their kids about it. I know I did. Um, did you talk to your kids? Yeah, we talk a little bit. You know, I, I, I think part of it is... Um, you know, I think my children, um, you know, we, we try and bring them up as normally as we can, but obviously given the life that I lead, they are just more and have been from a very early age, more attuned, attuned to current events and what's in the news. And, and uh, I don't want to say they're desensitized because I don't think anyone gets desensitized to that kind of thing. But I think they're, you know, they're, they follow events in the news. They follow the shocking things. They see the shocking things that occur in the world. But obviously, uh, you know, you always uh, you always try and talk to your kids at times like this and remind you that you love them. And, and try and make them feel safe in what seems such a yeah. turbulent world sometimes. You know, President Obama talked about faith a great deal after this happened. Right. And I don't know if you were able to see his speech on Sunday night that he gave. It was at the Sunday after the shooting. Uh, it was a largely theological mm -hmm. speech, mm -hmm. and he was quoting from the Bible, right. quoting scripture, and it struck me that faith informs a great deal of what he, how he shapes his decisions, particularly when it came to this issue and his, feel, his feeling that America needs to change to protect its children. How does faith inform your decisions or frame your worldview? Well, you know, I, 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 I guess like most uh, religious people, I... I pray regularly and ask for, for strength and for wisdom. Uh, you know, at the same time, as a, as a political leader in a multi-faith country, you know, I try to be uh, very careful not to look like I'm trying to impose my particular theological views on our country. And, uh, um, you know, one of the things that I encourage uh, my fellow Christians to do when they're in the political arena is really to look at the, the shared values that so many faiths actually have. Mm -hmm. And those are the things upon which, uh, upon which we as conservatives try to build. Um, but you know, there are times like this, um, you know, where you see the deaths of, uh, of children in this way. There are times like this where, uh, um, you know, where we're all reassured by the fact that there is uh, uh, you know, a benevolent power ultimately looking over all of us. I want to shift the focus a bit to hockey. I know you're a yeah. hockey fan. Yeah. How are you or getting? I was. <laughs> well, how are you getting your fix during this uh, well, NHL lockout? Or are you? Like, um, like so many, uh, like so many uh, Canadians, uh, you know. Obviously, my focus in the uh, in the 
Christmas, New Year's break is going to be watching the World Juniors. It's always a great tournament uh, to see the great young stars and see people playing for their country. Look, I, I can just say this, Donna. I, um, uh, you know, I know a few of the players. I wouldn't say know a lot really well. I know a few of the owners. Uh, maybe I don't know them really well, but I, I do know a few on both sides. And, and I just think this is a terrible tragedy. I, um, you know, on the one hand, you, on the player side, I mean, these, are, these are, are guys since they were little kids have spent their whole lives mm -hmm. trying to become the best in the world. And sure, they're making a lot of money, but at their hearts, they love what they're doing. And on the owner side, I know people talk about billionaire owners, but not many people got into hockey to make money. They got into hockey because they, they already had hockey. money. They already yeah. had money. And they love hockey. And they want to be, uh, you know, they want to contribute to the game. And it's a shame to see, you know, relationships get so, so antagonistic and so broken down that all that is put in jeopardy. And, and I just hope they're able to work through it because, uh, you know, I do fear that as this is going forward, it is, it is doing real serious damage to the game at the top level. Uh, my son is in grade three. Yeah. And he right now is studying democracy and decision making. Oh, yeah. okay. So I thought it would be a good idea perhaps to have his class pose a question to you sure. if you'd indulge them. Yeah. Great. The question is, what are the most important decisions you must make as a prime minister? The most important, um, you know, I, look, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't point to one or two. Obviously, some decisions are more important than others, uh, Donna. But what I, what I try and do, uh, I try and be, um, you know, as well briefed on the range of subjects as I can. Because, you know, I, I don't think we're in an era, you know, it's not like the movie Lincoln where we're deciding the Civil War and deciding slavery. We were in an era where there's a whole lot of decisions that have to be made. And, and it really is the accumulation of getting most of those things right. So I try and work hard, be well briefed on, on subject matter. I encourage my cabinet ministers and my caucus to do the same thing so that we make more decisions right than we do wrong because inevitably we're not going to get everything right. We're not, uh, we're not perfect. We can't see the future. I would tell you that the most, the most difficult decisions and the most difficult things that I do are things that involve our people in uniform and when it involves putting their, obviously, their lives on the line in dangerous situations or it involves, in the case where those decisions have been made and people have lost their lives, calling the families and expressing our condolences and appreciation. Those are the most difficult moments. They're the most uh, difficult decisions, but, you know, we are... We are blessed that we have people in this country, as we've had you know, all the way back to the War of 1812 that we're celebrating this year, people who have been willing, a small number of our citizens, willing voluntarily to sign up and put their lives on the line so that we can have the peace and prosperity that we enjoy in this country. And, uh, and we should never forget that. And a final question. What's the best part of this holiday season for you, apart from not having to endure a question period? The best part? <laughs> um, well, you know, look, we all like the break. Uh, the break is wonderful. Um, uh, you know, we're 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 busy and there's stress from time to time. Um, getting together with family. Um, you know, we uh, we have uh, we go to Calgary. We always spend uh, Christmas week at our home in Calgary. And on my on both sides of the family, we're able to get everyone together, have a big Christmas dinner, and 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 make a day of it and catch up. Uh, we come back here to Ottawa. We go to Harrington Lake uh, for the for the New Year's week. We're able to have our closest friends and family in the Ottawa area up uh, up and see us there. So you know that's the the great time. It's to spend that quality time with the people uh, that you love and the people who love you. Overeating and some couch time. Got yeah, I got to <laughs> stop that. Unfortunately, I do too much of that all the time. So I, you know, I can't really use Christmas as an excuse for that. Prime Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to yeah. talk to us. Thanks for having me, and let me wish you, your family, and all of your viewers a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. And well. all the best to your family as well. Thank you. Thanks.